Okay, folks. Uh, some of you saw the answer before I ex because I had it had to be rehidden. Um, just fill this out. Do spacecraft experience drag? Okay. So to show the results. <coughs> spacecraft experience drag. Now remember, this is the scientific type question. So is it true in a scientific sense? And the answer is yes, it is true. All spacecraft experience some amount of drag. Now, the engineering question is, is that meaningful? And if you're traveling at 50,000 kilometers an hour in interplanetary space, not really. Don't worry about it. If you're traveling at 80% the speed of light, absolutely. If you're in low Earth orbit, like the International Space Station, absolutely, it's important. If you're in very low Earth orbit, it becomes even more important because you may need to have propulsion just to maintain your orbit, constant propulsion just to maintain your orbit. Now, for the purposes of this unit, the rest of this unit, we're not going to worry about spacecraft drag, other than we talk about things like entry or re-entry. Um, but in the strict sense, it is true. Okay, let's close that poll. Um, we have some questions. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the midterm here in a second. Uh, yes, um, and the like. But before we get to that, just a quick aside on this one. Uh, obviously, if you watch the videos, you know what this picture is. Uh, this is the LEM, the Lunar Excursion Module, departing the Apollo Command Module on Apollo 11 to begin its descent. Now, the LEM is actually probably one of the most fascinating aerospace vehicles of the last six years. It is the first aerospace vehicle that is unflyable or was unflyable without computer assistance. Every aircraft to that point, I mark one. Every spacecraft with humans on board, Mercury, Vostok, Voskhod, Soyuz, Gemini, even the Apollo Command Module, could be flown without the computer. Not necessarily efficiently. In the case of Mercury, it was. Basically, if the astronaut, when people like Glenn flew it, it was literally cable controlled. You had an autopilot. Yes, you had autopilots, but you didn't need a computer. In the case of the LEM, there was no way you could do a controlled power descent without the computer. It just isn't possible. So the computer would take the inputs from the commander and the LEM pilot and figure out exactly how to burn the thrusters to achieve that descent. And this was a fascinating thing because at the time, what we know of as modern computing was just evolving. The Apollo guidance computer, which was used in both the LEM and the command module, in and of itself was a leap forward. It was the first use in an operational sense of integrated circuits. So what we take for granted in our laptops and our mobile phones. It was the first time anybody had ever used them. They were brand new. They were untested. They had definitely never been to space before. Now we use the microcontrollers we use in spacecraft are 10, 15, 20 years old just because we know how they behave. and We can harden them. In this case, they built it there. The skin of the LEM was about... If I remember correctly, and I could be completely wrong on my memory here, about six thousandths of an inch thick. Literally, if you poked at it hard enough, you could put your finger through it. Um, it was one of the most on the edge of working, not working designs out there. Uh, just fascinating. It also, <coughs> we had to do all of those burns to get from Earth to the moon, capture, land, and then go again. When you think about it, powered descent to the moon, yes, your gravity well is relatively weak, relatively shallow, but you have no atmosphere to help you. So all of your stabilization has to come solely from active control. You can't do things like grid fins 
create stability for your vehicle on entry. And that was basically capable of landing on its own. <coughs> now, of course, we have fancy things like rocket cranes and stuff for dropping rovers off on Mars and, and the like. Yes. So, in terms of absolute computing power, we're well beyond what was on there. The issue is these are not designed with that in mind. So the things about the way this behaved, how it fails over. But yes, with a real-time computer using a microcontroller version of something like what's on your mobile phone, or actually you can level of a Raspberry Pi, you could program something to make it work. Level of dependency and reliability may not be there, but just from pure computing point of view. Okay, some questions before we move on. Um, midterm is obviously on your mind. <coughs> so, what's the midterm like? It's 20 minutes, 22 questions, or 21 questions, sorry, 19 of which are multiple choice, multiple answer, uh, matching, fill in the blank, uh, ordering, those type of things. Two of them, and it's the last two this year, unlike last year, are calculations, where you have to do a calculation. They are simple calculations using things like the escape velocity equation or the specific energy equation. Yes? Yeah, so it is, it is worth it. If you don't know completely, just skip it. Don't click any box, tick anything, just skip it. <coughs> um, you do have a week to complete it. It opens its 1,800 hours this Friday and closes the following Friday at 1,800 hours. Okay? 20% uh, uh, for the unit average. Okay. Uh, oh, time to open the next survey. As we start the survey, I'll just do a quick talk about definitions. Most of these terms we aren't going to use till later in the semester. So don't expect you to remember them per se, but you can quickly look them up. The important ones here are apoapsis, conic section, eccentricity, gravitational parameter, inclination, periapsis. All of these other ones are when we're dealing with more sophisticated orbital mechanics, which we'll deal with towards the end of the semester, and you'll definitely do in space systems next year. <coughs> Just a quick thing on impulse burn. No rocket has a true impulse burn. We can approximate things as an impulse burn because they are relatively short compared to the overall time. So, in February is the plan of the first Orion Artemis mission. If that happens on time, they will launch the unmanned Orion capsule to go do an orbit of the moon and come back. The translunar injection, the escape burn from Earth orbit, is due to last approximately 30 minutes. That is an instant. However, remember the entire transit to the moon takes a couple days. So 30 minutes in 48 hours is relatively short. So we can approximate those as near impulse burn. So the para-Aryan represents what? Now, this is a bit of a trick question because it, I will ask you to think about something that's not really required for this. But the key one here is what is peri in this? So we can then narrow down stuff. So what is periapsis? Is it the closest or furthest point from the body? Closest. Okay, so we know it's going to be one of the nearest, not the furthest. Now, apsis is a generic orbit. You can have a periapsis around Earth, around the Moon, around Mars, Venus, Neptune, Sun, the galactic core if you wanted. So we know it's not the generic orbit. So let's just see what you all put. Of course, most of you put generic orbit. Now, the trick here is what is Arian? 
Yes, it is Mars. Um, I don't expect you to know that, by the way. Ah, when I hear Arian, I think of Mars. If it was Jupiter, what would we use instead of Arian? Jovian. Yep, Jovian. What's, her uh, what's the Greek goddess? Um, this is one I always forget. What's perihelion about? Or apihelion? The sun, yep. So yeah, it's the further, it's the nearest point about an orbit of Mars. Um, Neptune would use Poseidon in it. It doesn't really matter. I'm not going to trick you on an exam, and I expect you to understand what planet it is. But I would expect you, if I gave you para whatever, to realize that's the closest point, nearest point, and apo whatever is the furthest point away. Okay. <clears throat> what about closed orbits have which type of specific en energy? Strictly zero, which is what about 60% of you said, negative or positive. Now, this is, a, tr this is a, a tricky one. It isn't a trick question. Because specific energy relates to the orbital energy of that gravity well. So if it's closed, you are staying in that well. And therefore... You don't have enough energy to get out. That energy to get out is zero, so you're going to be less than zero. And this one's hard to wrap your brain around. I don't expect you to fully understand why yet. That's for next year. But just to know that any closed orbit is zero. The moment, or less than zero. The moment we hit zero, we have opened our orbit. We go above zero, our orbit opens up wider and wider. Okay? Bonded. Okay. For an orbit with an eccentricity of one, which of these is true? 39% <coughs> put a parabola, 32% put an ellipse, 32% put a skate, 29% said it has a specific energy of exactly zero, greater than zero on 17, conic section 12, blah, 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 blah. blah. Okay. Well, we know it can't be, top, the first two bits can't be, both can't be right. They're, they're mutually exclusive. Because an ellipse circle, a circle's a type of ellipse, but a parabola is not a type of ellipse. Those are closed, it's open. Okay, what's the eccentricity of a circle? Zero. If it's one, what's happened? Is it a closed or is it an open section? going to be open. So we know it's not going to be an ellipse. It's not going to be a circle. We know it's not going to have a specific energy less than zero. But it is still a conic section. All of these are conic sections. That's the beauty. If I say any type of orbit, it's a conic section. We're just taking our plane, cutting through our cone, and increasing the inclination. Yeah. Well, all orbits are conic sections. Yep, exactly zero, and it's a parabola. Yep. So, let's talk about the hyperbola. What's special about a hyperbola? Its eccentricity is greater than one. Its specific energy is greater than zero. Why would we want to do that type of orbit? We've got to put more energy in. Remember, that specific energy is energy we have to put into the orbit. Why would we want to do a hyperbolic, either departure or entry? Remember, we're having to put or take energy, put in or take energy out. Huh? May or may not be retrograde. Can be. But why would we want to do a hyperbolic departure? or hyperbolic entry. If I've got more energy, what am I doing? Think of it like kinetic energy. Some orbital maneuvers, but why would you want to use it? Yeah. 
So once I'm in that orbit, I'm not necessarily accelerating. If I'm trying to get somewhere, why would I want to get, why would I want to move faster? I could do a gravity assist, yeah. Well, you might be able to use it with it, but we could just do a, a straight burn to a hyperbolic. Because you want to get there faster. Especially when dealing with human beings, you want to get there faster. Um, believe it or not, we have done hyperbolic entries directly into the Earth's atmosphere with humans. They said it was a stupid idea, so they did it with Apollo 8, again with Apollo 13. Came in all of escape velocity directly into the atmosphere. Of course, that means we have to get all that energy out. That means heat fluxes are much higher and the like. But that's why we do hyperbolic trajectories. So when we have plenty of time and we want to make it mass and energy efficient, we'll tend to stick with parabolas or as close to possible. But when we have Mark I human beings, which don't do well with deep space environments, we want to minimize transit time and the like, we will tend to do hyperbolic. Bear with me a second. Computer in, so it is yelling at me. Okay. Um, how many points does negative marking subtract? <coughs> so negative marking is a bit of an interesting one. Uh, it depends on the question. For multiple choice, where there's one single correct answer, the negative marking for an incorrect answer is one over the number of incorrect answers, options. So if there are five, it's one over four of the points of that. So if it's a 10 point question, two and a half, minus two and a half. For multiple answer questions, it is generally minus whatever the each of the correct answers is, but it caps it. Okay, uh, is negative marking applied to every question? No, it's not. Um, it's only to questions where you are given the right answer in a sense, and you have wrong answers also to choose from. So things like <coughs> um, uh, fill in the blank or calculations, negative marking does not apply. Only the things like multiple choice, multiple answer, um, and the like. Ordering questions, there isn't negative marking, because of course you use all of them. Matching, there may or may not be. I don't think there is. It's just getting it right. Okay? So it's really multiple choice, multiple answer. Uh, true, false. Um, generally, no, it doesn't apply. Okay, what is specific energy? Now, this is a, a, an interesting one. We're not going to go into the details specifically on it. But just from the point of view of this unit, think of it as energy relative to that needed to achieve escape. <coughs> so if you're zero, then your net energy in your orbit is escape, and you've met it. If you're less than zero, you're still held about the body. There's a much more detailed definition. Um, we're going to leave it till next year for you to fill out. It's just understanding those relationships in terms, and the reason why is it hit the ground running in space systems next year and allows when you hear these terms to understand what's okay next survey this survey is about changing orbits these are the types of things that you'll get questions numeric questions on in the midterm the equivalent to the flight mechanics <clears throat> so it's things like I give you a gravitational parameter, an orbit, the like, tell you the current orbit radius, you tell me what the escape velocity is, or maybe I also give you a current velocity and you tell me what the delta V is. Yes? It is. Uh, it's usually given to you. Yep, yeah, on the exam. Or you can look it up. A big number with a lot of digits. It's back, I believe, in the units. 
stuff in last week's topic. One of the questions last hour was, wasn't a question, um, didn't get upvoted until I recommended people upvote it. Uh, it was a plea not to torture you. Uh, that, no, this isn't meant to torture you by any means. Keep in mind, in the grand scheme of things, each of these quizzes is inconsequential. Um, it matters for this unit, but beyond this unit, it doesn't matter. Missing a question doesn't matter. Obviously, the key thing I want you to do is not just randomly throw crap out. If you don't have a clue, don't answer it. Just click next. Don't click on anything. The reason why is very often we will get, and I will ask you something, and there are, I'm asking for three things, and you give me 30, because you are just literally in panic throwing stuff out there. If you do that, you are not demonstrating an understanding. Topic, and you're probably going to say something catastrophically wrong, like my favorite. That Mach number has to do with the speed of light. I haven't asked that in a while, but I used to ask that quite often on, on, in the prior incarnation of this unit um, that we used to teach about six, seven years ago, and invariably two or three students every year on the final say that Mach number has to do with the speed. It doesn't. That's wrong. Now, they may have said everything else perfectly correct. They've demonstrated a complete lack of understanding of what Mach number is about. It does have to do with the ratio and information transfer, just not photonic information, pressure information. Let's see where we are. So the first question on the survey, which 36 of you have answered, which is probably getting close. To minimize the energy required to change inclination, which of the following should you do? Um, last time I asked this, I left off the end. So I made sure I fixed that. So it now burns. Not last hour, but last year. Burn it to peri grade or combined burns and or combined burns where appropriate. So let's show results. 56% of you said combined burns where appropriate. 38% said burn at the apoapsis. 23 at the periapsis, retrograde and prograde. Okay. To minimize the delta V in energy required to change inclination, we want to do it at what velocity point in our orbit? Yes? The lowest. Okay. Where in an orbit, obviously circular orbits, though it's always the same, where in an elliptical orbit is our velocity the lowest? At the point closest or furthest from the body? Furthest. So apoapsis is where we want to do it. Okay, so that's the correct answer. Now, six, uh, updating your answer. 60% of you said combined burns where appropriate. Why might we want to do multiple burns at our apoapsis, or a burn at our apoapsis? What else might we want to do? Because that is absolutely appropriate. <coughs> Yep, you basically get more for the fuel you expend. And that will, depending what that burn is, you may go prograde or retrograde. But basically, instead of going straight ahead or straight back, you're doing it in inclination. Okay? Two, what factors affect the delta V to achieve escape? The current velocity of the spacecraft the depth of your gravity well, the radius of your orbit, the mass of your spacecraft, the direction of your burn, and the duration of your burn. Okay. The escape velocity slide. Get it here.
our escape velocity, VE, is just the square root of 2 gm. m is the mass of the orbit, the body you're orbiting. Why is little m? Why is the mass of the spacecraft not in here? What are we assuming? Why don't we care about the mass of the spacecraft? Huh? No? Remember gravity? It's G times the quantity, big M, M1 plus M2. So why do we not care about that second M? Yeah. No? It's too small. Uh, the system of Earth spacecraft is totally dominated by Earth. The mass of Earth is many orders of magnitude greater than the mass of a spacecraft. I mean, it only becomes important when you're dealing with large satellites, like Moon. And really important when you're dealing with satellites so large that the orbital center of that system is outside the radius of one of the bodies, Pluto and Chiron, for instance. Okay? So that's why we don't care about the orbital velocity, uh, the mass of the spacecraft. So we have our gravitational constant times the mass of the, the major body we're orbiting. That's how deep our gravity well is. R is the radius of our orbit, so the higher up we are, the further we are away, the less the escape velocity is. And as you can see, that's the surface. When we get far out, it's not a whole lot. <coughs> and of course, we're not asking about escape velocity, we're asking about how much velocity do we need to add So the depth of the gravity well. Now, why did I put direction of the burn as a correct answer here? Why does that matter to how much delta V we have to put in? If we burn perfectly prograde in the direction we're orbiting, that's our lowest delta V required. Why might we not burn perfectly prograde? Think back to the prior, prior question. Prior. Ugh. But you might be changing it. Why might we change our inclination on departure? Yeah. We're, we launch from Earth. Our inclination is about the equator. Now, in a few weeks' time, don't remember how exactly how many, I just because it's escaping me. We're going to talk about these more sophisticated things. We're going to bring up the ecliptic. The ecliptic is the plane of Earth's orbit around the sun. The equator is inclined to the ecliptic at what? Something like that. 23.6 degrees. Mars's orbit, for instance, and Venus's orbit are not on the ecliptic either. So even going to the moon, if we launch out of Kennedy, the moon's orbit isn't on the equator or the ecliptic. It's inclined. It turns out it's actually inclined about the same as the Earth's is, so it makes life easy. But we have to change the inclination. So we'll often do that at the same time. We'll combine our burns. That means we need a greater total delta V, but that's because we're getting more. We're getting, and we need less delta V than if we did them separately. But that's why the direction of the burn. It's not prograde or retrograde, it's the inclination of that. Okay, <coughs> to raise your periapsis, what type of burn should you undertake? Prograde at the periapsis, prograde at the apoapsis, retrograde at the apoapsis, or retrograde at the periapsis. Now, we burn pro, that is in the direction we're traveling, to raise our orbits. We burn retro, the opposite direction, to lower our orbits. 
You hear about the term retro rocket that they fire before to initiate entry. That's against that. So we know we want to raise it. We know it's going to be a prograde burn. Now, the thing you always remember, our lowest energy, lowest delta V point to raise that part of an, a part of the orbit is to burn at the exact opposite point on the orbit. So if we want to burn, raise our periapsis, that's our lowest point, we add energy at our furthest point away. If we want to add energy or raise our apoapsis, we add energy at the periapsis. So for the periapsis, we burn at the apoapsis. It raises the bottom of our orbit. Conversely, if I say, where should I burn to open up my orbit, to do escape? Why do I want to burn at Perry? Yeah. Yeah, I want to take my app to infinity. That's what opening it up does. So I would burn. You do, you see, and you watch it. They burn those injections <coughs> are always set. Now again, remember, we're not doing impulse burns in reality, so you don't bang. This isn't, that would really hurt. You burn either side, and depending on more sophisticated orbital mechanics, because anything like this, far sophisticated than this back of the envelope we're doing, your burn won't necessarily be perfectly centered. Or shift a little bit. Okay. Do I accept bribes? Uh, no. Um, put it bluntly. Why would I accept a bribe? Okay. So let's talk about it from the rational homo economicus point of view. If I were to accept a bribe, it would have to be large enough that I would never have to do anything again and could live in an island that doesn't have extradition rights. No, I don't accept bribes. Um, so, funny story that I have never been approached for a bribe, and I hope to keep it that way. Um, however, I do know an academic in another university that was in his office meeting with another academic, and a student on an MSc course came in to discuss his results, or her results, male or female, their results. And the student was despondent. They hadn't done as well as they would have liked. And they wondered if there was any way they could get a better classification. Which, of course, the way we do stuff, no. First of all, when we sit down and do classifications for you guys or MSc students, it's basically procedural. And it's just a series of questions. What was the average? Is it above this mark? Yes. Is it below it? Okay, if it's below it, is it in this range? Yes or no? No, you get the lower one. In the range, is more than a certain percentage of the credits in the final year above this mark? The classification mark, yes, you get the higher classification, no. Even where it isn't procedural, it's anonymous. This is student 12. I don't know who student 12 is, but we don't know. There's nothing we can do. And then, by the time you get a classification, it's written down. The only way that can change is by appeal due to a material defect in process. So, anyhow, there's no way he can change it. The student is very despondent. Out comes an envelope with a large amount of cash in it. It's on the table. Does anybody see the problem with it? Huh? Well, no, it's not the free money. Yes. Uh, that's, I think, the intent of said student. Now, remember what I said about the situation when I set it up. It wasn't just the academic that the student was talking to in the room. He did it in front of a witness, or she. Um, don't do that, by the way. Needless to say, that student not only did not get a higher classification, they didn't get any classification. Um, so, 
I have no idea. That wasn't related in this story. I cannot vouch for the truthfulness of it, but I can vouch that the person involved is generally truthful. Um, yes. No more questions, guys. You don't have to have any more. Remember, <coughs> next Monday, we have a practical session. It's in computer clusters four and five up on the second floor in this building. Based on your time, if you're at the one o'clock or the two o'clock session, you will join a set of groups. I'll send an email out shortly about it. Um, the groups are three or, groups of three or four. It's up to you. You can choose. You get to choose. Um, anything less than three, it's a bit much work. Uh, that is the only session we have next week. There is no meeting in here because you are to be consolidating your knowledge from topics one through six for the midterm. I like that. This, okay, okay, I, I'm torturing you. I'm not telling you for yet. Um, yes. So that level of, of watching you squirm, I do like. Um, okay. Uh, any, oh, uh, sorry. Week 11. But it's, it's more useful to tell you the answer in the appropriate context of why that aircraft is or isn't important. Because I, you know, we can like aircraft that are complete disasters, by the way. Um, uh, do we have an... No. I, I don't know if it's in your timetable or not. But there is, you don't have to watch any topics this week. <coughs> I mean, you're welcome to watch topic seven for a week, two weeks from now, but you don't have to this week. Why, why is your favorite aircraft an example? It isn't anymore. Um, it was one year because it was supposed to have already been there. It was, did you actually come to that lecture? Uh, again, you can't afford it. It isn't an exam question anymore. Uh, maybe. Yes, maybe. Um, depends how you define disaster, too. Ain't the spruce goose. Um, which, questionable whether it actually was even. Hmm? Okay, folks. Um, if you have nothing else, I will see you on Monday.